Hello, 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 and welcome to the zone. Our on-screen presence has become the new business attire. And just like a well-fitting suit or a good-looking dress can give you that extra boost of confidence, so can the knowledge that you're looking great and sound good on camera. And my guest today is someone that has not only embraced looking good and sounding good on camera, but she's teaching hundreds, thousands of people to do the same. So it is my great, great pleasure to welcome into the zone today, Kat Mulvihill. Kat, what a real, real pleasure to have you here today. Yes, thank you so much for inviting me, Claudio. I'm excited to be live with you today. You have been on my list of dream guests for a long, long time because I became aware of you, your YouTube channel, probably about two and a half years ago. I was doing a corporate workshop about on-screen presence, looking good, sounding good on camera. And one of the elements was a quick introduction into OBS. So people started to really, really look at that OBS and say, wow, virtual camera, that's so cool. I want to learn how to do it. And then I was faced with a decision. Do I record a quick tutorial or do I hit YouTube and go search for one because I just didn't have the time to do it, right? And who did I find? I found Kat with like a 15 minute super tutorial on how to use OBS with Zoom. And ever since then, I've been following you, Kat. And again, it is such a pleasure to have you on this show here. We will have a lot of fun talking about on-screen presence, how to elevate your, your image, your sound, and use the tools that make you way more effective when you are meeting in online settings. But before we get to that, very, very quickly, let's say hello to our viewers online. Um, we have a bunch of people here right now. We have the facilitator, Said from Germany. Said, real, real pleasure seeing you here. Martin from Norway. Nathan Gold from the Bay Area, where the sun is peeking out over the stormy clouds this morning. All right, Nathan and... Uh, the facilitator team cat and also a big big hello to patrick strebel who is joining us from dallas texas so cat you transitioned extremely well from meet space into the online meeting space tell us how did you how did you go about it? When did you, um, and how did you realize that, hey, the rules are changing and tomorrow will not look the same anymore as yesterday? And then how did you manage to embrace this new way of communicating so well? Well, it's interesting that you asked that because I was just reflecting on that this morning. I guess I was, I was writing an email and I realized that my introduction into the virtual space was actually in 2019. It was the first year that I was working on my own, running my own training business. And I knew that I wanted to not just serve people locally in person, but I also wanted to reach people outside of my area. And so I was using Zoom before 2020, before everything shut down. I was running some webinars and I was also recording video. I got myself a webcam and a microphone and a teleprompter. I started to record videos at home and I also I bought a nice backdrop because I didn't <laughs> I was ashamed of my background and what during that time when I would record content and watch it back it just didn't feel right and then when I would watch back a live stream I would go live into Facebook for example just I thought who is this person that I am watching because it doesn't feel like me because I know that I'm excited about these topics and I, I this is not coming across. And so it was actually really frustrating. So my initial foray into the online space and virtual presenting was not great. And it and it's because I didn't really understand the differences yet. I was comfortable speaking in front of groups, 
but transitioning to a camera was a bit rocky. And it wasn't until 2020 when I started to learn that the camera has an effect on your energy and that what you're putting out there isn't necessarily what the audience is receiving. And so as soon as I understood that and I could make those adjustments, that helped. So it was a combination of understanding what was going on, but then it was really important to, I say, put in the reps. I had to keep showing up, practice, and just continually doing that over and over. You don't get better just by learning about being better. You have to actually put in the time, the effort, and the practice. And so there are some old videos of me where you, it's before I learned those techniques, before I practiced, and then there's the after. And that's where I really started to find my style and how I felt comfortable. But it was, it was a rocky road, about around eight months, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, sure. It does take time. And I think this is where many people give up, right? They learn and we will, we will get to that in a moment about virtual cameras and tools like OBS or Ecamm or mm -hmm, many, many tools out there, right? And they're maybe even downloading it. And then they get to the point of, oh, wow, there's work involved to make this work. So we'll get to that in just a moment. But you mentioned something very interesting, and that is that we come across differently on camera than in a, a life situation. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, well, what, what I was led to understand or what I was taught is that the camera sort of steals your energy. And so what's actually coming across is not necessarily what you are truly saying. And so in order to adjust for that, we sort of need to dial up our energy. We need to compensate for it. I also think though, because it can happen in person. So if you imagine standing in front of a room, a small room, and there are only three or four people, how you speak to three or four people is going to be different than if you're in a room with 50 or 100 people because we tend to expand our presenting to match the scope and scale of the room. And when I was first learning to speak in front of crowds, I remember my instructor explaining that the bigger the room, the bigger the expression, the bigger the voice, the gestures. And I actually, I wonder if that's part of the connection as well. When you are in a room with a camera, it feels intimate. And so you would almost naturally talk to someone as if you're sitting across the table, which tends to be a little bit calmer. But if I was suddenly in front of 50 people, I am going to be projecting more. I am going to have a little bit more expression because I'm trying to match the scale of the room. And this is totally a theory. I have no idea if there's any backing to this, but it's something I've been thinking about because I am curious how that translates because I notice in person how I show up and how I talk does depend on the scope and the size of the room and the audience. And I, I think all of us adjust naturally depending on that size. And if the size of your room is just a camera in front of you, it feels really intimate, like you're just talking across the table. Mm, very good. And Saeed uh, agrees as well and says this sounds legit. So you mentioned before that you started uh, with Zoom before the pandemic, before everybody else got forced into these online meetings and Zoom, of course, is, I think, the most popular platform today for online meetings. Now, we like to play games here and I have a little trivia prepared. So there is the first trivia. Oi, oi, oi. Oh, that oops. is show behind the curtain. <laughs> right, right, right. Show <laughs> behind the curtain. All right. So. <laughs> Which one of these is not a video conferencing platform? A, Zoom, B, Teams, C, Butter, or D, Toast? Which one of these is not a video conferencing platform? Is it A, Zoom, B, Teams, C, Butter, or D, Toast? And while our viewers are thinking of the answers, let me also quickly say hello to Laura. Laura, thank you for joining us. And we have two um, answers so far, actually three. <laughs> so we have Nathan saying C, butter is not a video conferencing platform. Vinod says C, Martin D, 
And the facilitator, Said, said it's Teams because that's not a platform, that's a curse. And quite frankly, Said, I absolutely agree with you on this one here. Now, um, of course, Zooms, Zoom and Teams, they are pretty much a given. Now that leaves us with butter and toast. Kat, what is your take on this question here? The answer is D, final answer. <laughs> final answer, D, without even using a lifeline. Wow, very cool. And yes, of course, you are right. D, Toast is not a platform for meeting online, but Butter is. And the person that turned me on to Butter originally was actually Said. Said, the facilitator, he was uh, conducting and um, facilitating a training, a workshop the other day, and he did it on Butter. And it was the first time that I used it, and I quite liked it. Uh, have you been invited or hosted a meeting on Butter as well, Kat? Yes. So I first learned about it through, I think it was Jan Keck, who yeah. mentioned Butter a while back. and. So I tested it out with some friends over the summer, especially a friend of mine, he teaches improv. And I said, you should probably try Butter because you can customize flashcards and different activities. And so then it's a really nice way to incorporate improv games into your meetings. And he tried it and said it was excellent for that. But my, my experience with it is my only, my only recommended improvement would be it's hard to pin people. And I really like to have a bit more control over windows and how I can place things. And mm -hmm. so that's been one of the downsides, I think, to me fully using it more. But it is something I think I'd be open to using more in the future. I do love the integration with a lot of the games and not games, activities, I guess you could say. And mm -hmm. I think that's just a brilliant move on their part. Absolutely. I found it very, very playful. It was really a fresh yeah. uh, a breath of fresh air, right? Uh, yes. Knowing, yes. knowing these platforms and yeah. Zoom, okay, we've all gotten used to it. Teams, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so when we are speaking of these tools and things like that, right? Um, my my progression was, you know, I went from originally Skype, right, because I started my online coaching business back in two thousand and eight, and I did that mostly on Skype at that time, and then morphed over to Zoom as it became more and more popular. And I've always been a person that wanted to, you know, have that certain wow factor in meetings and. When I saw Zoom, okay, you can do these virtual backgrounds. I started to do slides on that, right? And then just moved on the side so that they were behind me. And I, I used the arrow keys on my keyboard to go through the different backgrounds. And it was cumbersome, but people went like, ooh. And then I went on into other platforms I played with. You know, mm -hmm, I used OBS for a long time. So I'm interested in your journey, Kat. Uh, you were using Zoom, you were using your webcam. How did you gradually, what, what was the first step, the second step until you got to how you look today? Well, I think it, it actually was live streaming that, so, so I was using Zoom. I took a course actually in 2017 that, uses, that used Zoom to teach. It was a fully remote course. And so that was my first introduction to it. And I just kind of thought of it as, a web conferencing tool, that's how we meet and you can share your screen. What actually helped me was I had joined a course, it was an online course, and there was live support calls and they were in Facebook. And the teacher would show up on Facebook Live. And that was the first time I saw Ecamm. I didn't know it at the time. I just thought, how is she seamlessly going between her face to showing her slides and then she can show her face beside her slides. What is happening? And it was so remarkable because I hadn't seen anything like it and it really impressed me. And honestly, she just had three scenes, her camera, her slides or her with her slides. But the way that she would flow in between them felt miraculous watching. So I had learned about Ecamm and this idea of streaming software to set up scenes through that experience. And so my first experience with that on my own 
was using Ecamm to go to Facebook Live. And so I was practicing how to use that. Now at the time, my computer could barely handle it <laughs> because it was an older <laughs> computer. It did not have a lot of memory. The fan would kick on, it would get so hot. And I could not actually stream very long before I would have to go cool down the computer in the basement. But that was my first experience. And then it wasn't until, wasn't until the pandemic when I realized l they can bridge and that there's such a thing as a virtual camera. And as soon as I saw that, that opened up all of the doors because a lot of the training I was running was happening through Zoom once everything closed down. And that's when I started to really bring the virtual camera into Zoom meetings. Wow, very, very cool. So you went immediately to Ecamm. You didn't step through OBS? No. no, I only okay. I learned OBS through necessity because I realized if mm -hmm. I wanted to help other people use a virtual yes. camera, yes. not everyone could use Ecamm. And so I yep. learned it really mm -hmm. so that I could teach other people how to use it. So okay. I am not I have to admit I am. Uh -huh. I, I know we have a pro. I know the facilitator is a pro. Y yeah, sure. but <laughs> I don't I don't use it on the everyday because I use Ecamm generally as my main tool mm -hmm. and I've learned enough about OBS to teach other people, but there are so many more levels to OBS that mm. are just possible that I haven't learned yet because I'm not using it every single day. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's just not enough hours in the day <laughs> to do all right. the things right. I want to right. do. Right. And for me, it was actually OBS because I didn't want to spend the money for a professional solution, right? Yeah. So I was like, no, I, I got to tip my toes in first. And so I used OBS for a long, long time. And then I switched to a green screen and I felt that the chroma key detection in OBS at that time wasn't really that good. And so I t downloaded the trial version of Ecamm and it just worked. The chroma key, it just worked perfectly. And you know, it's a 14 day free trial after two days. I was so sold, I immediately signed up and was like, okay, I'm part of this wonderful, wonderful Ecamm family now and haven't looked back. But I still use OBS from time to time, just like you to stay in, you know, what's going on, what's the latest and greatest. Um, Nathan makes a comment here, using the tools that Kat is talking about is one of the biggest competitive advantages you can have in the video world. And I absolutely agree with that. Thank you for the comment, Nathan. Kat, you are nodding as well, right? I mean, this is the competitive edge right now. Well, I, I, will, I will say I love, I love having tools at your disposal that genuinely truly stand out. Everything we're doing right now, we could bring into a live call and most people have never seen that before. So running a quiz at the bottom of the screen, that almost never happens. And so people mm -hmm. pay attention longer. You, When you're on a virtual call, you are competing with everything else on that person's computer. You're competing with email, you're competing with browsers. And so keeping someone's attention is really difficult. And we want we have an important message hopefully it's an important message when you're presenting so how do you keep that person engaged however the caveat is that all of the tools in the world don't necessarily help if you don't work on some of the non-tech skills when you are presenting and so i would also really encourage landing the basics so practicing being engaging with your voice practicing having some emotional range with your voice matching the message and the emotion behind the message to what you're trying to say. So really connecting through a camera, making eye contact, those are all things that also make a difference. And sometimes tech fails. <laughs> and if yes. we can't just show up without the tech and still be able to hold our audience's attention, then I think there's still some work to do. And learning the tools is one aspect of it. I think learning the essentials of connecting on camera regardless because those will also carry you through no matter what format. If you are answering a phone call or if you are, have to record something on the fly, being able to really hold your own speaking to the camera, I think is so, it's an invaluable skill set. Indeed. And it goes absolutely in line with what Saeed just uh, mentioned as well in the comments, right? Connection first, content, and then the tools, right? Because, yeah. yeah. 
you need to have the right content, the right um, uh, connections first. All right, so are you ready for another round of trivia? I think you are, and hopefully our audience is as well. Let's see, because this is something that bugs me sometimes when, when, when I'm in meetings and people are coming in and they have not the, the um, aspect ratio that I would expect, right? So what aspect ratio is generally considered best for professional video presentations? Is it A? four by three b 16 by nine the facilitator is fast c one to one or is it d two to one again a four four by three b 16 by nine c one by one or d two by one we have a couple answers so far coming in let's have a look we have saeed with 16 by nine and everybody else throughout the board as well. B. What is the right answer, Kat? B. Final answer. Of course, final answer B. And I want to also quickly welcome Yash and Nadia. Glad that you could join us here. Vinod as well. Always great to see you here. All right, so um, 16 by 9, 4 by 3, video format. Um, what are your priorities in terms of the tech that you have around yourself, right? I mean, we have computers, we have maybe a laptop that has a camera in it, that has a microphone in it. So I'm good to go, right? I can look good with those kind of cameras and microphones or maybe not. <laughs> oh, but I would say that a lot of the newer computers that are coming out have mm -hmm. good cameras. The very first thing I would focus on is always audio. It is, I, especially with the advances in a lot of the built-in cameras, they are good quality. And if I can see a person, great. Yes, you can get a higher quality camera, but I think first you want to nail the sound and Actually, maybe let's revert. So the sound is really important, but your computer, the strength of your computer is also really important. So I would say if you are someone who is looking to get into a few more of the tech advances, like having a virtual camera, having different scenes, pulling in music, bringing in guests, that you want to make sure your computer is powerful enough because spending money on a fancy camera when your computer is the fan is kicking on and then it's overheating and it starts to lag that's going to be really distracting mm -hmm. but if you're going to start somewhere i would probably start with audio getting a microphone so that you sound good and also understanding your space i am not a an expert whatsoever when it comes to microphones and audio i feel like i've learned enough to help some other people and my biggest mistake was buying a very very sensitive microphone that picked up everything in my environment because i did not understand that some microphones are more sensitive than others and so understanding how much control you have over your space when it comes to sound that's also really helpful to to know when you're picking a microphone mm, indeed indeed and you know, it's so interesting that you do say the microphone because there was a study at the University of Southern California that really, really proved how important the microphones are. They took a professor, uh, uh, recorded the lecture on video, and then they showed it to different groups. And each group had a little bit degraded sound quality. And they measured a couple of elements that we measure when we look at a successful and effective presenter. And one of them is, of course, credibility. And with each level that they took down the audio, the credibility went down as well. So to me, that was really interesting to see. And these are unconscious you know, uh, impressions that we are getting, right? We are not thinking, oh, this person has such poor audio. But unconsciously, we don't make such a yeah. connection. What microphone are you using, Kat? So I am, you can actually, it is in the shot. Everyone always says, I can't see your mic, but it's actually mm -hmm. here. 
and mm -hmm. it is the Shure MV7. I it is a bit more of an expensive microphone, but it mm -hmm. has the the dual choice of whether you want to plug it in through USB or if you want to use an audio interface and use an XLR cable. I'm using an XLR cable right now that's connected to the Rode Streamer X, which is a small audio interface that I have on my desk. I used to have the Rodecaster Pro because I bought into the <laughs> hype when I was starting out with YouTube and everyone seemed to have one and I thought it was gonna change my life. And I also imagined that one day I would probably have a podcast with guests and I would carry it around and all of the things we think when we're justifying a purchase. And it was so big and it took up too much space on my desk. So then I moved it out of the way, then I couldn't even reach it. And so I just thought, <laughs> this is not, I need to solve this problem. So then yep. I, when I learned about the smaller audio interface, now technically I probably just could have gone straight back to my USB, but I mm -hmm. do like to have some options and some control with having an audio interface. But I like that the microphone has either USB or XLR. So if yep. you are just getting started, you could grow into it if you decide to start with USB and then you could move towards using XLR and there are more and more options. I mean, I bought this, I think in 2020. And so mm -hmm. there have been so many more microphones that have been released onto the market since then that have the dual interface and yeah. that are more affordable potentially. So looking at your budget, looking at reviews, seeing what's a good fit. Wow, this is so interesting because I hear this more and more and more. The same story about the Rodecaster Pro 2, right? I, I'm, I, I'm in the same boat, right? Uh, it, was, it was a little bit over a year ago before Christmas last, la, you know, the last one, right? And everybody was buzzing around. Oh, this product is coming out. And, and I had to jump through hoops to get one to Thailand, right? Like when, when it just came out, right? And... And I installed it. I, I got a kick out of the voice changer, you know, to sound like Donald Duck. And that was all cool stuff, right? But like you, I found this thing is so big and it's just on my desk. And ultimately, I uninstalled it as well. I did then connect the microphone back to USB and do it with software on the Mac right now. One of it is Audio Hijack and the other one loop back that I'm using in combination to get the same effect that I did with the, the um, Rodecaster Pro. Very cool. So I have here a question from, oh, not a question, but a comment from the facilitator Said and Light. Yes, Light is absolutely crucial as well. The best camera does not work without Light. I mean, yeah, that's a given. <laughs> just saying <laughs> i think i think it's a it is a good point around but when i work with clients i will often if i can see them clearly mm -hmm. then i am going to focus on other things so if someone says yep. oh i need to fix all this stuff and i said right now mm -hmm. i can see you clearly i can register your face you're you're positioned appropriately so that you're not too small in the background and you're not too close if everyone can see you, that's where I would potentially, if you're looking to invest in upgrades, I would make sure you're first looking at a really great microphone before then you switch to the camera, et cetera. But that being said, you, you have to be visible. And so adjusting your lighting is definitely going to make a difference in being visible. So yes, I agree. And some people get really hung up on it when they don't need to be. One of my, when we were talking about the Rodecaster Pro example, a, a question that I use over and over anytime I'm thinking about spending money is asking myself the question, what problem does this solve? Because a lot of people, when it comes to getting set up in their studio, they see other people's studios and they think I need to buy this thing because everyone has it, but they're not actually answering the question, what problem does this solve? because often that's how we end up with stuff that is just too much. It's more than we need because we didn't yep. stop and consider what's going, you know, what's going on. So for some of my clients that I've worked with where they have, where they're perfectly visible, there's they are well lit, even if their camera is not of the highest quality, spending a bunch of money on that right now is probably, they don't have a lighting problem or they don't have a visibility problem. So 
it's about asking those questions every single time you're going to make an investment. At least that's my experience. Also, even with software, don't mm -hmm. add on software without knowing mm -hmm. what problem it's solving for you. Absolutely. Where were you two, three years ago? Because for the last two years, I have suffered under a syndrome they call gas. You may have heard yeah. that, right? The gear acquisition syndrome, you know, just get the new tech because it's new. Everybody's talking about it. But does it really solve a need? And I have to say, I deviated uh, from my original mission because my original mission was to do everything absolutely low key on a budget, right? And, and do it as simple as possible because I know there are so many people out there that would like to look good and they don't have the budget or they don't want to spend all the money that some of the pros are spending in $2,000 cameras and the light for whatever, right? And of course, that is possible. Uh, no question about it. So Kent, let's play another quick round because we also have another game here in store. And I did not even mention that yet, other than in the announcement. That it, and that is everybody who's joined us here today, I've been adding your names into my wheel of names to draw a super generous offer that you can win cat. What did you um, allow me to give away on the zone here? So I have a, there's a recording of a workshop I ran a few months ago called Virtual Camera for Beginners, which is really nice if you are just getting started or haven't yet with the virtual camera, meaning setting up scenes in a tool like OBS or Ecamm and then bringing them into your conference call, whether that is Zoom or something else. And in the workshop, I go over what are the things you need to know when it comes to the virtual camera and then walk through a demo. And I do use OBS as my demonstration because it is free and it is accessible yes. to all computer type. Well, maybe not all yep. computers, but it's, it's available for Windows and Mac. And, and Linux. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, and Linux I have too. I yes. no yep. experience with Linux, so yep. I just don't yep. even mention it. <laughs> yep, but it's available. It, is more, it mm -hmm. is more accessible. And so the, the virtual camera goes over that. So it's a recording of the workshop and it includes some graphics as well that you can drag and drop to start playing with some scenes and getting some practice. You are so modest. Some graphics is like a pack of like 99 graphics or something, right? <laughs> oh, no, that depends. <laughs> That, that no, there's a, there are different ranges depending on which one you get. So I think that the basic one comes with the basic pack. So there are okay, are, okay. It is, actually, it is it is a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Think, but it's a lot. It's. <laughs> I may have given away the wrong package. Three or four. Oh. <laughs> All good. All good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So before we get to that drawing, right, let's quickly play another round of trivia here because I know I know that people simply love these uh, things. The rule of third is a composition guideline for which element? Is it for your audio setup A or B your video framing? C your lighting design or the, your monitor arrangement because today everybody needs three monitors right so rule of third right so yeah so is it a audio setup b video framing c lighting design or d the monitor arrangement and the answers are coming in here we have the facilitator with the camera that's not even an option Said it's the video framing <laughs> all right all right but we have b b b b b so everybody is pretty much on b what's your take cat b B, B as of well. course, I, I of agree. course, B. And one other follow-up question that I quickly wanna wanna bring up here while we are already playing, right? And that is, what year? And this might be challenging for you too, Cat. So, what year was Elgato, the maker of Stream Deck and the prompter, founded? Was it A, two thousand and five? B. 2008, C, 2010, or D, 2013. Again, the choices 
of when Elgato was founded, A, 2005, B, 2008, C, 2010, and D, 2013. Oh, 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 okay, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have a That's really, <laughs> really trigger happy finger here today. <laughs> I just wanted to say, okay, people are Googling this right now <laughs> because the answers didn't come in and I wanted to switch to this scene here, of course, but you know how it is with the stream deck. If you're not looking at where you're pushing, Sometimes you're pushing the wrong button. But yes, Elgato was actually founded in 2010. So the company is already 14 years old and they have just recently really entered the mainstream because of people were forced into these online meetings and are looking for tools, right? So yeah, but pretty, pretty old company. All right, Kat, uh, I think the moment has arrived. We have a full house. I think everybody or most people are still here. Of course, you have to be here in order to win this prize. Um, let's go to our wheel of names and we have all of the names in here. If you made any comments during this session here or you are here and haven't made a comment then please just type in the comment something and I will add your name as well. Uh, Vinod, there we go. Thank you very much Vinod. Okay, you are added as well. Thank you Vinod. And so to make this fair, let me shuffle this two, three, four, five times, and then let's spin the wheel. Almost Nathan, but it flipped over to Nadia. Nadia, congratulations wonderful wonderful i think you will love going through this uh, workshop recording and get a lot of tips from cat um, nadia you are on linkedin so is cat please connect with each other and take it take it from there congratulations again nadia so Kat, let's get back to your journey to on-screen presence greatness. What were your biggest challenges that you encountered along the way? Ooh. I, I would say the biggest challenge is to overcome just showing up because there are so many times where there's a little bit of a mental hurdle for showing up. There are days maybe where I was not feeling up for it, whether that was if I had a live training or I said I was going to be live on YouTube or something where I had made a commitment to show up, but I showed up anyway. And I had to remember that the presence matters and how you show up matters. And that would usually be enough to sort of kick me into gear and to really be present in the moment but it's not always easy. And there are times where, especially if the stakes are higher, I still get nervous pressing the button, whether that is starting a meeting or going live, all of it can still give me a little bit of a butterfly feeling. And the way I interpret that is that it means something that I still care about what's going on. And then whenever that happens, being present in the moment, I just think trying to have, trying to set up everything in advance so that you can trust your setup you can trust your knowledge you know what you are talking about you hopefully care about the topic that you're teaching or discussing and i think that can really come through and you can lean into it and just remember that you have something important to share and that you want other people to hear it so just tuning in yeah wonderful advice and you have always come across to me as a super authentic person. And I believe this is probably the secret of your su success. Not, not probably, I'm absolutely convinced that authenticity is because 
you're not doing anything flashy. I mean, there are people out there right now that are doing a lot of editing. They call it retention editing, you know, the zooming in, zooming out with all flashy and whatever. And I, quite frankly, these kind of videos stress me out, right? So, <laughs> and then I, I, I go to the next video and there is Kat again in her calm demeanor and still fully energetic and so authentic. What is your number one tip for others to find that authentic voice? Because it's so easy to slip into some other person, some ideal presenter that we have in mind when we push that record button or go live button, right? What is your number one tip to stay absolutely authentic throughout your, your time in front of the camera? This is a good question. And there are so many answers that are coming into my brain. But the one that seems to be rising to the top is the term connection. I think that if you are connected to the content or the topic, the thing that you are showing up to discuss, that's one piece. But also connection with the people on the other side of the camera and really thinking about what what's in it for them? Why are you sharing this? Why does this matter? Because if you're connected to the content and the purpose and the people who are hearing your message, then I think it makes it easier to show up because it's not you're not putting on an act. You are trying to convey something with a purpose. And if you feel connected to that, it is so much easier. I think all of us have probably been in a situation where we didn't feel a connection either to the content or to the people we, we were reaching out to. And it just, it starts to come across. It's flat, it's dull, and it's, they're just, they're not engaged. And I think people can feel that. So I think connection is really a big key to showing up as yourself mm -hmm. and conveying the message that you wanna convey. Absolutely, absolutely loving what you do meaning content wise also helps. And Saeed is truly, truly living that as well. We only have a minute or two left. The time flies so much whenever I talk with you, uh, Kat, it's, it's amazing. So final question, what's next for you? I know you are, you are moving uh, a little bit in a slightly different direction. What's next for you? Well, actually I am, I think today, yes, today, <laughs> I am sharing more details about a five week accelerator program. And this is a small group, it's sort of high touch, small group program that will be getting in those reps. So having five weeks of working together as a small group and that repetition, finding your voice, finding your setup, feeling confident, feeling confident and comfortable and having a setup you can trust, but also then you can be fully present when you are speaking to groups. And it's the first time I am running it. So the first group that's this kind of pilot cohort will be slightly experimental. <laughs> But I've got some really great ideas and I haven't been this excited about a project in a while. And so I am I am thrilled about this. So it's I don't think I've I th I'm sharing it today. After this, I'll be telling everyone on my email list, but I'll also be sharing about it online. And then now when you say other direction, I you might be alluding to the fact that I also love to talk about productivity and sort of keeping mm -hmm. organized in the background. And that's just it's a passion I can't ignore. So I just talk about both and presenting, but also I have a lot of opinions and thoughts on productivity and I just care about it so much. So on LinkedIn, I do talk a lot about productivity, but I still love, I still love both. I love presenting, I love productivity. And I just decided instead of picking one lane, I would just pick two. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And maybe at one point in the future, you can come back and we talk more about the productivity side of getting ready for your presentations. And everybody out there, you just heard Kat is doing a very special program. Connect with her on LinkedIn or visit her website and sign up to her email list to stay informed and if you do have the time, I can wholeheartedly recommend to jump onto that program because in those five weeks, you will elevate your on-screen presence tremendously. 
And if you have enjoyed this program here today, we do this every single week. So please subscribe to my channel and you will um, get notified when we go live again. And with that, Kat, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for spending your time here with us this morning. Thank you to everybody out uh, there who has joined us live and of course everybody who is watching the replay. And with that, I wish you all a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And we shall see each other again next week. Bye-bye.